The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Good afternoon, and welcome to our 13th Issues in National Security Lecture for Academic Year 2021-22. or I'm Commander Gary Ross, and I'll serve as your host for today's event. Professor John Jackson, who normally is your excellent moderator, will be presenting his lecture on drones and robots. I'm looking forward to hosting you today. Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield is on travel this week and won't be joining us, so we wish her a safe return. For anyone just joining us, I want to reiterate that this series was originally conceived as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. Over the past four years, it has been restructured to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family to include members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, and colleagues throughout the Naval Station Newport. We will be offering two additional lectures between now and May 22 for a total of 15, spaced about two weeks apart on a wide variety of national security topics and issues. An announcement detailing the dates, topics, and speakers of each lecture will be sent by me, both on email and posted on our website. Our next lecture will be on Tuesday, 3 May. We will feature an engaging discussion on humanitarian assistance with Professor Hank Brightman. The reason for this four-week interlude is that NWC will have spring break in two weeks. Each lecture event consists of three parts, the scholarly present speaker's presentation, a question and answer period, and then on occasion, a family discussion group session. This final segment is of primary interest to family members residing here in Newport, and it will feature guest speakers from various support activities and organizations here locally or on base. Okay, on with the main event. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature of Zoom, and we will address them at the conclusion of the presentation. I am very pleased to introduce our speaker, Professor John Jackson. Professor Jackson will discuss the past, present, and future uses of robotics and unmanned systems, both in the military service and in private use. His fast-paced, fact-filled presentation will discuss the systems involved, the operational challenges they address, and the legal and ethical ramifications of their use, known by many uh, as the Duke of Drones. He will draw from his recent book, One Nation Under Drones, to address everything you all always wanted to know about drones, but were afraid to ask. Professor Jackson is a professor in the Naval War College's College of Distance Education. He teaches in the area of national security affairs and also serves as program manager for the Chief of Naval Operations Professional Reading Program. A longtime proponent of emergent technology, he has co-moderated one of the college's most popular elective courses entitled Unmanned Systems and Conflict in the 21st Century since the 2009 academic year. In March 2010, he was called to testify before the U.S. House of Representatives Subcommittee on National Security regarding this course and the attitude of military officers towards evolving technology. In October 2017, he was appointed as the EA Sperry Chair of Robotics and Unmanned Systems he retired from active duty service in the Navy at the rank of captain after 27 years of service in the logistics and graduate education fields. He has been listed in Marquis Who's Who in America since 1997. In December 2018, his book, One Nation Under Drones, was published by the U.S. Naval Institute. One reviewer called it quote, a unique and seminal work of extraordinary merit, unquote. He has lectured on unmanned systems at venues ranging from the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, the American University Washington College of Law, and the New York Yacht Club. I am pleased to pass the microphone over to Professor Jackson. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, my mother would have appreciated that introduction, so thank you, Gary. 
Uh, it's interesting that uh, we've been given this lecture for a number of years, teaching the elective course. Every time we go through it, things have changed, and what we'll try and do is uh, update it a little bit, talk about what's going on, in, uh, going on in Ukraine with drones, and try and give you a broad idea of how these systems are being used. You can't pick up a magazine or newspaper or anything else without seeing something about drones. Everybody has an opinion. There's lots of issues related to their use. Are they legal? Are they moral? Are they effective and whatnot? So we're not going to get into every bit of that discussion today, but we'll touch on some of it. You know, we ask, is this a uh, new idea? And uh, as with most things, it generally is not. This is a, a Sperry automatic airplane from the 1918 time frame. Uh, this was an attempt to uh, fly an unmanned aircraft. They would uh, take it fill it full of uh, explosives, point it in the general direction of the target. It would take off, it would fly, and count the number of times the propeller went around. And when it got to a preset limit, the motor would cut off and it would dive on the target. Not exactly precision guided munitions, but uh, it was effective, and uh, even though the war was over, uh, they found that this was a, a good potential use of these systems. Uh, they quickly adapted to radio control, which gave them a degree of control that they uh, previously did not have. This is a model of the, uh, of the Sperry aircraft. And uh, again, in those days, just getting an aircraft up into the air and getting it to fly, Pretty amazing. Uh, the ability to do it without a pilot on board is, is quite uh, significant. So uh, we're going to jump ahead to World War II front time frame. And there was an actor named Reginald Denny, which uh, our grandparents may remember. Uh, he was also a fan of uh, radio-controlled aircraft. And he said, you know, these really should be able to be used for something more than toys. Uh, if you're a gunner uh, on a ship or a, a cannoneer ashore, you need to practice what you do. So the way to practice was to tow a target behind an airplane and you would shoot at the target behind the airplane. At least that's the theory. Don't shoot at the airplane. Uh, they said, why can't we use something like this as a target and either tow a target or use it as the uh, destructive uh, target itself? And so over 7,000 of these Denny mites were built and used during the Second World War. So they were built out in California, and uh, this is a photo of a young woman who was uh, building drones. Uh, they sent photographers out to take a picture and said, you know, she's uh, pretty attractive. I, I bet she could do something more than build drones. It's Marilyn Monroe. So this is the ultimate bar bet. If somebody says, how did Marilyn Monroe get her start? The bottom line is she was uh, building drones. So there's a nasty rumor that Lady Gaga is getting in the drone business. And if that's true, I'm getting out of the drone business. So, so let's move ahead. We're going to kind of look at aerial systems, uh, maritime systems, ground systems, and we'll move pretty quickly, but it'll give you a taste of uh, each of these different types of uh, systems. This is the Global Hawk. This is a long-range surveillance aircraft. Uh, it basically can take off from California, fly to Maine, overfly Maine for eight to ten hours, and then fly back to California, uh, you know, up to 30 hours in the air at a time. And uh, they are very, very successful in what they do. But it's a ground surveillance system, and so the uh, Navy thought they needed one, so we'll show you the maritime version as well. This is the Triton. And the, uh, the game is a little different, whether you're flying uh, over open ocean, uh, they fly considerably lower than the uh, Global Hawk. There's an aircraft carrier on the screen there. They do not take off or land on an aircraft carrier. Far too uh, large to do that. But the, uh, the Triton is in operation now. It flies in conjunction with the P-8 Maritime Patrol aircraft. And so the P-8 can go out to 8 to 10 hours at a time. The uh, Triton can go out to 30 to 40 hours at a time. And so the Triton will go on station. If they see a target of interest, then they can vector the manned aircraft in. And the P-8 does have an ability to attack if uh, necessary. So it's a manned, unmanned teaming situation, which is uh, really the way the future is going to be done. This is uh, out at Point Magoo. This is a... Uh, Triton aircraft, and that's me. Uh, to give you an idea, I'm uh, six foot two, 
and uh, nobody in the audience is buying that for some reason. So I want to prove to you, this is me and one of my co-moderators here at the War College. And as you can see, I'm a six foot two. So as we go through these slides, I'll kind of be the, uh, the uh, measure of each of them as we go through it. So here's Reaper. This is uh, one of the systems that uh, most people are uh, familiar with. Uh, unmanned, it uh, has the ability to do uh, reconnaissance, surveillance, and also attack. Uh, when the uh, systems were first developed, they were strictly reconnaissance. And the story goes that it was flying over in Afghanistan, saw a group of people standing around a very tall, turbaned-wearing individual, and they decided it was probably Osama bin Laden. By the time they were able to vector a uh, weapons platform over there, they'd broken up and they'd left. So it was the CIA initially that says, could we fire a weapon from this aircraft, or would the mere uh, firing of the weapon rip the wings off of it? So they uh, did some experiments and discovered that, yes, indeed, Hellfire missiles can be launched from these aircraft, uh, gravity bombs can be dropped, and so they've become a very, very efficient target uh, in attacking uh, that uh, particular group of folks. This is uh, out of Creech Air Force Base. Uh, that's a uh, Reaper in the air. Uh, they have a hole in the ground. They make the Navy guys stand in so the Air Force guys look taller. Anyway, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So. Uh, a lot of talk about Ukraine. And so this is a couple of photos of a Turkish unmanned system. It's similar in many ways to the Reaper. Uh, cheaper, not quite as good, but it does the job and has been used with uh, great effect uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I'll show you a couple other American-made uh, drones that are also be being used. But, you know, if the enemy controls the skies, you don't have the fighters, the bombers you need and whatnot. If you have an ability to use unmanned aircraft, it helps to balance that equation a bit. And we've all seen the uh, footage of the hundreds of uh, armored vehicles and whatnot, which have been destroyed by the Ukrainians using shoulder launch weapons and also using drones. The Navy, again, is interested in flying uh, unmanned aircraft from aircraft carriers. The uh, Triton is far too large. This is the unmanned combat air system demonstrator. Uh, this was the unmanned aircraft that was able to take off and land uh, on an aircraft carrier, one of the most demanding missions that any uh, pilot has to fly. And uh, this is an indicator of the size of the, of the UCAS. And uh, the system was also able to do air-to-air -air refueling. So this was, in this case, the uh, large tanker was passing gas to the uh, unmanned aircraft. The Navy has since said, well, maybe we could do this in reverse, and why don't we have an unmanned tanker version that will allow us to uh, refuel manned aircraft? And so that's where the latest version is going. That's the carrier-based air-to-air refueler. Uh, the MQ-25 Alpha, the Stingray. And it is designed as an air-to-air -air refueler. And uh, Boeing has the contract. They're under construction right now. Boeing built a demonstrator aircraft using their own funds, and so we're actually flying a version of this today, uh, doing all kinds of technology uh, studies and whatnot, risk reduction. And uh, we hope to see these active on carriers within the next uh, 48 months. And uh, it'll give us the ability to launch the F-35s or other aircraft, go out near the target, rendezvous with the air-to-air -air refueler, tank up, go in and do the mission, come back out, get refueled, and come back to the ship. Also allows you to have aircraft in the air when the rest of the air wing is grounded at night and at other times. And the uh, belief is that this aircraft would ultimately be able to use, be used for uh, reconnaissance and potentially attack. But initially it's designed as an air-to-air refueler, but it's the uh, way to get uh, unmanned aircraft on the flight deck of a carrier in uh, close order. This is the RQ-170 Sentinel. Uh, this is a uh, low observable unmanned aircraft. And many of you may have seen uh, the footage of uh, uh, the command authority in Washington while the bin Laden raid is going on, watching something on the screens. 
Uh, it's been ad admitted that uh, there were sentinels in the air uh, taking pictures of what was going on during that period. So it's uh, smaller than the UKS. It does not fly from carriers, but it's a uh, stealthy platform that gives us uh, all kinds of capabilities. It was originally called the Beast of Kandahar when it was seen flying out of Afghanistan and whatnot. A lot of discussion about what's out there now. We talk at the unclassed level at all times and whatnot, uh, but the belief is that there is a, a follow-on to the uh, Sentinel out there in flight. Going downrange to a bit smaller and whatnot, this is the uh, Marines Blackjack. This is a, a version of the Integrator, which is a, a commercial version. And uh, again, that's an indicator of the size of the uh, of the airframe. You'll note I'm wearing a blue shirt. Uh, I took these pictures. I was in a conference for a week, came back, and my boss says, you're wearing the same shirt in every picture. So it looks to me like maybe you went to the conference for one day, took all the pictures, and then went to play golf. So the moral of the story is change your shirt uh, before you take all your pictures and explain to the boss what's going on. So going down to a smaller version, this is the uh, AeroVironment switchblade. And uh, as you can see uh, on the one side, that's about a 19 inch long airframe. Uh, it has a warhead. This is one UAV you do not want to come back because it has a warhead in it. Uh, it's about a grenade sized warhead, so it's anti-personnel and uh, light vehicle. And you can see on the side there, the operator is launching it from a compressed gas canister and then is looking in the control uh, system and the switchblade will fly for about 15 or 20 minutes. It's a loitering munition. Uh, it decides which target uh, is, is most appropriate and then the operator will drive it in on that target. There is a big brother to it called the uh, switchblade 600 which is 51 inches in long, long as opposed to the 19 per inch version. And it launches from a, a tube, as you can see here. This is an indicator, again, of the size. And this has an armor person, armor piercing warhead, a javelin warhead in this device. And uh, you may have seen in the press, it's been talked about, uh, over 100 of these systems have been shipped to Ukraine and they're uh, uh, building up to send more. So there's a, a number of units of the uh, Ukrainian army that go out at night. The uh, Russian tanks are sitting somewhere, but they're still radiating heat, and they're able to drive right down on top of them and destroy the target. So very, very effective and efficient. And it's a, it's a smart system, and so the operator just needs to basically put the uh, uh, crosshairs on the target, and uh, the system will do the rest. This is the switchblade again, a little more explanation of the, uh, the capabilities of the system. So. The Special Operating Forces, the SEALs, Rangers, et cetera, really like these systems. It's kind of a backpackable cruise missile, if you will. And so they're able to carry with them at all times these systems. You know, the uh, Predator, the Reaper, armed, the Gray, uh, gray Eagle flies uh, for Army. Uh, but if you're an operating force, you have to ask permission. You have to get that aircraft to come fly. It's got to be deconflicted with other missions and whatnot. So the operators really like the notion of something that's organic to their unit. They can take it with it. They can command it. It's there when they need it and whatnot. So the capability of uh, these, these organic systems is very good, and the troops really, really like them. There's a version of the, uh, the switchblade known as Blackwing, and this is used by the submarine force. And it's similar in size to the 19-inch uh, uh, switchblade, sorry. And what it does is launch out of a flare tube from the submarine while the submarine is launched, breaks the surface, flies up about 1,000 feet, and basically gives the submarine a 1,000-foot tall periscope. Uh, the submarine has to be at periscope depth to get the data coming back, but still it gives you that ability to understand the situational awareness of what you're seeing around you. There's no attempt made to recover the, uh, the uh, black wing, although in uh, tests they do 
recover it with a net when they're doing tests, but in operational concerns, the point, price point is such that they don't need to try and recover it. But again, the submarine force really likes it. They fully integrate it into their weapons control system so that they've got this capability with them everywhere they go. This is a loyal wingman. This is a concept that says, uh, why don't we have a, an attritable aircraft? And that's something that is cheap enough that you can use it and you can lose it if necessary. Not disposable, but it could be a tritable or a tritable. And the notion here is that you're gonna have manned aircraft, perhaps with four or five loyal wingmen flying with them as additional uh, carriers for ordnance or doing surveillance, jamming, whatever the case may be. And so this is just a, uh, an artist's conception. Kratos and another a number of other manufacturers are building these now. And we think this is what you'll see coming in the, in the future with, again, manned, unmanned teaming. So are pilots going out of business? No, they are not. But uh, the pilot may have some other tools they may use, and the pilot may not be in the vehicle itself. The pilot may be operating from somewhere else. This is uh, DARPA's long shot, which is the notion that uh, what if you had an unmanned aerial vehicle that could carry other unmanned aerial vehicle or weapons so that you would launch this perhaps even from a cargo carrying aircraft, launch it, it gets into the area you want to operate and it launches the, uh, the weapons from there. So again, ways to expand the capability of the uh, forces that we currently have. This is Gremlins, uh, interesting design, and the notion here is that uh, uh, C-130 or a C-5, C-17, whatever cargo carrier would have a number of these Gremlins. They would uh, drop them out of the back of the airplane. The Gremlin would go do its mission, whether it's surveillance or ISR, jamming, whatever the case is, would then return to the aircraft and be recovered in flight. So it's actually gonna put out a, uh, system that will capture the gremlin, bring it back into the airplane so you can uh, take it back, uh, refuel it, and take it up and use it again. So uh, it's flying aircraft carriers, if you will, kind of like the uh, large Navy uh, uh, airships did back in the 30s with uh, catching aircraft in flight and uh, bringing them back aboard. One of the big issues is swarms. Uh, you know, there's, you've all seen swarms above uh, the Olympics and above the uh, Super Bowl and others where hundreds if not thousands of uh, unmanned systems are flying together. Uh, it's a big concern. Uh, we believe we have the ability on our surface ships and on our carriers and whatnot to defend against tens or dozens of, uh, of attack aircraft. What if you were trying to defend against hundreds or thousands of small systems uh, coming at you? And you don't have to sink the ship, you just have to destroy the radar and have a mission kill and whatnot. So swarms are something that's a, a, a real issue for all of us in the US and our allies as to how we're gonna use these ourselves and how they might potentially be used against us. So we've talked about uh, aircraft, fixed wing aircraft. Let's talk a little bit about rotary wing. This is a, a fascinating design uh, for a guy who apparently doesn't care too much for his legs because it's just a scary looking thing to have all those rotors flying and whatnot. But uh, this is a, a more realistic version. This is the, uh, the Fire Scout. So this is a uh, unmanned helicopter. It's a Bell 407 helicopter which has been converted into unmanned use. And it is uh, designed as a surveillance platform. Again, uh, there, it's currently in operation on uh, US Navy and allied ships. It usually flies on board a ship with a manned helicopter and fire scout. And so the fire scout can fly when the manned aircraft cannot, or if the, uh, the uh, pilots have reached their flight time and whatnot, the uh, fire scout can go out and do the surveillance that you need to know what's going on over the horizon. Uh, question, can it be armed? Yes, uh, they've done experiments with arming uh, these vehicles and whatnot, but at this point, it's uh, primarily a reconnaissance platform. And this is the uh, smaller version. This is an earlier version uh, of the fire scout and again, an indicator of the, uh, of the size of the vehicle. This is Lockheed's K-Max. And this is a uh, fascinating uh, 
use of unmanned aircraft. The, uh, in the, the Iraq and Afghanistan, we found that the IEDs were one of the biggest threats and we would take uh, caravans of trucks to uh, resupply outlying posts and they were subject to attack by IEDs and other factors. So the Marines said, well, what if we didn't have to use the roads at all? What if we could fly our supplies direct to the forward operating base with an unmanned helicopter? So this is K-Max and it weighs 6,000 pounds and it can lift 6,000 pounds and it flies unmanned and it has kind of a rotary device so we can actually take four pallets of payload to four different locations. Operator on the ground at the end just puts a laser spot on the ground and the system will deliver the, uh, the product wherever you need it. Uh, flew very successfully, uh, it went over to Afghanistan for a six month test, uh, stayed there for three years. And now the question that uh, Marines are asking and Army is asking as well, you know, do we have money in the budget to buy a uh, logistics helicopter that will kind of follow in the mode of the K-Max and give us that capability? This is a, a very interesting uh, device. This is called the VBAT. And uh, certainly the Navy folks in the audience uh, know that there's always been a desire to have an aviation capability on a uh, small combatant. We've done it a lot of different ways. This is a uh, platform that flies straight off the deck, off the helo deck. It then rotates into horizontal flight, flies to whatever its mission area is, uh, surveillance or again could be weapons carrying. Then it comes back, tilts its nose up and lands right back there on the uh, on the landing spot. And it's a ducted fan, so you can see pictures of the crew just going out there and grabbing this thing and setting it down on the uh, deck of the ship. So uh, it is also used ashore. Uh, a lot of interest, again, by special operating forces and others. Uh, you can take this system and uh, take it out of the uh, package, set it up and have it fly in about 10 minutes and can fly it for extended periods uh, doing whichever of those missions you want it to do. So quite, uh, it's getting a lot of uh, interest. So let's look uh, even smaller. We keep getting smaller and smaller here. This is uh, the Instant Eye Quad Rotor, and the Marines have decided that every squad should have their own organic unmanned air system. And so uh, uh, squad, quads for squads is the term. And you can see the operator uh, lifting that thing into the air. And again, the idea is always what's going on. I want to know what's on the other side of the hill before I have to go over there and fight with it. So uh, this has uh, been very successful and uh, thousands of these systems are in, in operation. Getting even smaller is the Black Hornet nano drone. And you can see how small that is. That is designed again as a reconnaissance device. Uh, the troops will wear a uh, carrier unit on their chest and they take this thing out, they flow it, throw it in the air. They can see on their control unit what's being seen. They can fly it around the target for about 15 minutes and then bring it back, pick it up, recharge it, and send it out again. So these have been, uh, again, very, very popular with uh, the special operating folks, both the uh, uh, in UK, US, and other services and whatnot. But, you know, it looks like a toy, but it's uh, absolutely not a toy because if you can save the life of an individual because you're able to fly over that compound into that area and see what's going on, it uh, is a tremendous asset. On the civilian side, this is a concept for a uh, unmanned aerial vehicle taxi, Chinese company called Yihang. And the notion here is you go to the taxi, you get in it, you uh, look at your iPad, you push a button, say, take me to Providence. It lifts off, no pilot, no parachute, just one terrified passenger. And it takes you to where you wanna go. And uh, there's a lot of money being spent by a lot of companies, uh, Uber and Lyft and others that say, you know, this is the future, is the ability to be able to go and call a helicopter in to wherever you need to go for whatever transportation needs you may have without having the, uh, the, the pilot requirement that you would have otherwise. So 
Uh, I'm not sure I'm ready for that, but uh, this is another design for something called a Volo Copter, and that's me at uh, the Singapore Air Show uh, inside. It can be manned or it can be unmanned. And again, you can see that round structure and there's rotors, electric rotors on all of those uh, uh, facilities around the, uh, the circumference of the device there. So uh, again, there's a lot of flight tests being done, a lot of overseas action. FAA, a little more difficult to work in the U.S. with uh, some of these uh, new designs and whatnot. So a lot of the work's being done overseas and then hopefully once they've proven the concept, we may see them fly. In, uh, in U.S. airspace. You know, I'm a firm believer in the FAA doing their job. You know, I have to fly aircraft too, and I want to make sure we don't hit anything that uh, we shouldn't be uh, flying alongside and whatnot. So I encourage the FAA to do what makes sense, but don't be overly restrictive in what they're trying to do. This is a uh, small drone. Uh, there are literally hundreds of thousands of these, basically kids' drones. This is one you may remember back in January 15 that somebody decided, I wonder if I could fly that on the White House lawn. And so they did and got everybody excited because they're very, very difficult. You know, they're, they're uh, mostly composite or plastic materials. They don't really show up on radar. They're easy to fly. You fly low and then you jump over the fence with the aircraft and you do whatever you want to do with it. So uh, a lot of concerns with, you know, how do you do the counter UAV, the counter unmanned aerial vehicle mission? And so there's a, a number of ways that have been looked at. This is the, uh, the best picture in the whole presentation. This is what I call my John Wayne picture. And uh, this is a uh, system called Skywall. It's a counter UAS system. And the uh, company brought it to the front lawn there, the War College. And it's a device. It has a compressed gas uh, canister in the back. It has a range finder, view finder. You basically follow the UAV as it's coming over. And when you lock your uh, crosshairs on it, it gives you a beep, beep, beep. And you press the uh, trigger, and it launches a projectile. The projectile gets near the target, splits open, drops out a net and a parachute. So the net captures the drone, the parachute brings it down. So it not only protects the people below it from being hit in the head with the thing, it also gives you the ability to go and find the drone and hopefully try and figure out where it came from. So this system is, uh, also has uh, permanently installed versions that can protect buildings, uh, runways, et cetera. Uh, I've seen it in use protecting Air Force run, One on some of its flights and whatnot. So uh, it's a, uh, a, an interesting answer. It's relatively short range, but uh, uh, that's where you need to pick these things off in, uh, in many occasions. This is another version. This is a drone killer, and this is a jamming device. So this will actually jam the control signal that is controlling the drone. The problem is it also tends to jam other uh, systems, radios. Uh, if you're using it in a civilian environment, it terms, tends to screw up uh, everybody's uh, reception and whatnot. So uh, it's not as good as a kinetic version like Skywall, but in some applications it's, uh, it's very efficient and uh, uh, a number of companies are providing these systems. And they've even trained hawks to uh, go and capture drones. So uh, the, uh, some people complain, well, wait a minute, the hawks are going to hurt their little claws. So they got little Kevlar gloves and put them on the claws of the hawks. And so when they attacked the drones, they didn't hurt their claws. So uh, is it practical? I, I don't know. You know in fact, these, uh, these birds will knock these things out of the sky and whatnot. But it's just an indicator of some of the things that are uh, being tried in the counter UAS uh, mission. So let's switch to uh, unmanned uh, maritime vehicles. This is kind of a uh, look at a couple of different potential designs. This is the uh, Sea Hunter, and this is uh, built by Lod Ly Lydos Corporation, and it is an unmanned platform. It was originally designed as the Autonomous Continuous Trail Unmanned Vehicle, active, and the notion there was it was going to find an enemy submarine and stay on top of it and follow it for days, weeks, whatever at a time. 
they have done that mission, but they've also said this can do a lot more than that. And so they've built a second one. The Sea Hawk is now in operation. And uh, it has gone uh, totally unmanned from San Diego to Hawaii and back, all with autonomous control. It has a deck house on there, but in reality, there would be, be no one aboard. So it's just one indicator of what uh, we're thinking about for uh, unmanned surface vehicles. This is a, a picture of a Chinese vehicle. Looks strangely familiar and uh, an awful lot like uh, like Sea Hunter and whatnot. But you know we're studying these things and our opponents are studying them as well. And you know it's uh, long been known you don't have to necessarily develop the technology if you're able to steal the technology, and that uh, that has been done on a number of occasions. This is Ghost Fleet Overlord. So the uh, intent here was let's take a, an offshore uh, oil Derrick support vehicle and convert it to unmanned use. And the Strategic Capabilities Office, SCO, has purchased several of these ships and converted them to unmanned operation. And you know, there's enough, enough deck space there that you can fly helicopters. You could theoretically be a weapons platform. And so they have transited from uh, San, uh, Norfolk to San Diego. 98% of the time, totally unmanned. They've had observers on board, but no one is operating the systems on a daily basis. So uh, uh, there is now the U.S. Navy has a surface development group in San Diego, and they have uh, Sea Hunter, Sea Hawk, the uh, Ghost Fleet Overlord ships, uh, LCS, and a number of other air uh, surface ships, and they're trying to decide exactly how these things are going to be used. You may have seen uh, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Gilday, a few uh, weeks ago said the U.S. Navy needs 500 ships in its fleet and 150 of them should be unmanned. Pretty bold statement and uh, uh, we're not exactly sure, but there's a lot of design work being done on small, medium, and large unmanned surface vessels. So what would they do? Would they travel with a uh, carrier battle group? and be pickets out front doing uh, surveillance work? Well, would they be carrying uh, many, many weapons and be a, uh, an arsenal ship, such as shown here, where you'd have uh, hundreds of missiles on board and they would be targeted and launched from this vehicle, targeted from the manned platform? So Navy's taken a hard look at it. Congress has uh, gotten in the mi mix and said, you know, are you guys sure that you can take a large size ship and put it to sea for six to nine months and not touch it? Can you really have the technology that would allow that to do it? And so what the U.S. Navy has said, well, we're going to build a shore base uh, uh, prototype and we're going to start it and we're going to run it for six months and see how it goes. And if we have problems, we're there so we can fix it. Uh, a lot of discussion, so maybe there's a flyaway team on a uh, surface ship that is able to go aboard the unmanned ship and do repairs as necessary. But there's a lot of uh, systems that uh, you know can work uh, for extended periods of time without any on-hand uh, maintenance, and so that's what uh, we're hoping this will be able to do for us. This is a, a design for an unmanned cargo ship, and. Uh, uh, the uh, cargo folks are saying, you know, do we really need anybody aboard that ship? Or could we operate it from a central location in London or somewhere? And the ship itself understands the rules of the road, will avoid collisions. You'll be uh, basically controlling it from a lo remote location and whatnot. And can you do that and then save the cost of having that crew and whatnot aboard? So a lot of work being done in this area, a lot of work being done on you. Know, once you get it into port, can you unload it robotically without having uh, the huge shoreside facilities that are necessary and whatnot? So uh, it, much more than military looking at these issues. This is an interesting uh, device called the SAIL drone. And uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, several of these were launched from Newport Harbor, uh, operating on behalf of the uh, University of Rhode Island. And they've gone off for a six-month tour in the uh, uh, Atlantic, uh, looking at the Gulf Stream and measuring 
temperature, depth, salinity, all the kind of things that you're, you're interested in, particularly if you're a submariner, but if you're an oceanographer. And there are solar panels there providing electrician, electricity, but that's a solid wing, and that wing will move just like a sailboat wing will move, but it's commanded from a facility in Oakland, California. So amazingly, these things are out there floating around in the ocean, commanded from a uh, command center in Oakland and going where they need to go to do their mission. Pretty robust. They actually sailed a sail drone through a hurricane and it survived. So uh, there are hundreds of these things and plans for many, many more to uh, be out giving you long-term surveillance of the ocean, both for military and for civilian purposes. So we've talked about uh, air systems, we've talked about surface systems, let's talk a little bit about undersea systems. This is an eye test for you, but it simply indicates there's a whole family of vehicles from small, small ones that can be handled by two individuals all the way up to extremely large. These are some of the smaller versions. You can see them being launched. Uh, there are a number of these, uh, the US Navy flies uh, or uses these. Um, for surveillance, ocean surveillance, et cetera. And there are bigger ones, and this is kind of the prime example. This is the uh, Echo Voyager, which uh, is a similar version of supporting a program called ORCA. This is uh, me at the launching of uh, ORCA, and I didn't have my blue shirt, but there I put the blue shirt on. Uh, this thing is an amazing submarine and that's the size of it. It's 80 feet long. It's eight feet in diameter. It has a cargo carrier uh, area of 34 feet in length. And so you can see there uh, myself and the, uh, the Echo Voyager. And so what's it going to do? Okay, well, you can open that top and you can uh, launch missiles. You can launch UAVs. You can open the bottom and put out mines. You can open the top, put out seals. It will dive to 11,000 feet depth of water. I say again, 11,000. 1,100 feet of depth is pretty pretty significant. 11,000 is, is almost unheard of. But it's designed to do that. It uh, is a free flood hull with uh, aluminum uh, pressure vessels that control all the electronics. If you build those pressure vessels with titanium instead of out of aluminum, you go to 18,000 feet depth of water. Truly, truly remarkable. Boeing spent $100 million of their own money to develop the Echo Voyager. You know, if you build it, they will come. Well, in fact, uh, U.S. Navy is very interested. Uh, the oil and gas industry is very interested. Oil and gas has more money than DOD. Uh, they're interested in using these things for uh, surveillance, for pipeline construction, for uh, laying undersea cables, inspecting undersea cables, a lot of those kind of missions. Uh, the U.S. Navy is kind of, yeah, that's fine. You know, I would just assume the enemy not know whether that target is U.S. Navy or that's Gulf Oil or that's somebody else out there floating around. Significant interest in, uh, in the, our allies, uh, you know, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force and others are very interested in the potential capability. So Navy has ordered five of these. They're currently being built by Huntington Ingalls Shipyard, and then they'll be outfitted by uh, Boeing. And Boeing says it's a truck, and you tell us what you want to do. So it's diesel electric. It'll operate for about 48 hours at a time on its batteries. Then it comes up to periscope depth, puts up a snorkel, runs a diesel generator, and recharges its battery and goes off to do its mission. And so it's designed to do missions of six to nine months at a time. Again, this is an, an opportunity where you're not going to be able to touch the machine, but can you keep it operating for that extended period? Uh, it'll come to the surface. It'll, uh, if it's doing a surveillance mission, it'll uh, send that data back. You can uh, reprogram it, reassign it to what you want it to do. About uh, 50 to $100 million a copy. It's a lot of money in my bank account, but not a lot when you're comparing it to a billion, several billion dollar man submarine. 
it can't do everything a manned submarine can do, obviously, but it can do a lot of things, and that will relieve the manned submarines to do uh, more challenging missions. But if what you want to do is lay off a coast somewhere, lay off a harbor somewhere, observe what's going on and whatnot, uh, Echo Voyager slash Orca is certainly a, a way that uh, potentially can be done. Very quickly, we'll talk about ground systems. Uh, this is a pack bot. The uh, military, the army, and uh, marine forces and whatnot, uh, IEDs, as I mentioned earlier, are the, the greatest loss of life and uh, most uh, significant wounds and whatnot uh, were because of uh, IEDs, improvised explosive devices. So the military has got a number of uh, robots to help us in that mission. This is PackBot, and the idea here is you send it downrange to see if that uh, piece of paper is a piece of trash or it's covering an explosive device. Uh, if you need to destroy that device, the robot will leave an explosive uh, package and back away and detonate the device. Uh, very, very successful, a lot of different versions. This is the Mars, the uh, mobile armed robotic system. And uh, this is almost like a mini tank. So as you can see there, it has a machine gun, it has a laser dazzler, it has a tear gas dispenser, has a microphone and a speaker system and whatnot. And it's controlled by an operator. That's one of the former presidents of the War College. And when I told base security I was bringing a robot with a machine gun through the gate, they said, come talk to me, John. We, gotta, we need to check this thing out. But it uh, has been used uh, experimentally. It's been used on the DMZ between North and South Korea. And the notion is it is always under human control. You know, big argument about do we give a machine the authority to make a kill decision. The U.S. position is no, we do not. There will be an operator on the loop, in the loop, whichever the case may be and whatnot, but uh, fascinating capability. This is called MUT, and the Marines, uh, Marines are very forward-leaning on unmanned systems. And this notion here, is there a way to offload some of the weight from uh, a trooper's uh, back? Uh, people don't realize that a modern uh, infantryman will carry more weight on his or her back than a knight in shining armor used to have uh, with his suit of armor. So you take some uh, soldier or marine, you fly him to some location, you throw him out, put his stuff on his back and ask him to go do the job. Say, well, can we offload some of that? Can we offload uh, weight, food? batteries, maybe a weapon system and whatnot. And this is a design for one of those. Kind of looks like the guy in the back with a gun doesn't trust it because he's uh, pointing the gun at it. But, uh, this is a whole family of everything from really small ones that you throw in the window. It goes in there and it looks at what the target might be and whatnot to a large version there with wheels, which would be the, uh, the mule that would go alongside the troops carrying all that material. Boston Dynamics has done a lot of work. You may have seen some of these on TV. You know, making a robot walk like a human being really got to be easy. We've seen it done in movies for decades. Well, guess what? It's really hard. And so uh, Boston Dynamics has done tremendous work with various systems. This is uh, Atlas. And uh, if you want to have some fun, Google, uh, Google Atlas. Uh, the robot picks up the box, that guy takes the uh, hockey puck, knocks it out of the robot's hand. The robot bends over, picks up the box again, he knocks it out of his hand. Then you can see the robot looking at the guy and saying, when we take over, <laughs> you're the first guy because <laughs> you were really making my life miserable. So uh, a lot of different uses. Uh, uh, there was a design for a, uh, a shipboard firefighting robot. Do you have to have a human being to go into that space, uh, dewater it, uh, put out the fire and whatnot, or can you have a robot do it? Operating on a shipboard environment's tough, stepping over uh, door frames and other uh, obstacles and whatnot, but uh, significant work being done in that area. This is uh, the course we teach uh, unmanned systems and conflict in the 21st century. Uh, we. Pre-pandemic, we would bring the operators in here and we'd do our own little version of battle bots out there on the uh, patio and whatnot with uh, a whole range of systems that are in use. So driverless cars will whip through very, very quickly. Uh, 
uh, you know, Tesla and lots of other manufacturers now are doing driverless cars. You know, they are not totally driverless. Even Tesla says you need to have your hands on the uh, steering wheel and be ready to take over when necessary. There have been a number of deadly accidents, and in some cases they found that the uh, drivers were asleep. One was watching a video. Uh, the video was still playing when they took his body out of the car and whatnot. So, you know, there will come a day when you can get in the car and say, take me to Chicago and uh, go to sleep. Uh, it's not here yet, and there's a significant amount of work yet to be done before that's uh, happening. But, you know, billions of dollars being spent to, uh, to make these systems work. On the civilian side, this is a, a system called Zipline. Uh, it's being used in Africa pretty extensively. The uh, roads and whatnot are all, not always the best, particularly in rainy season and whatnot. So the idea here is if they need to move medicine, uh, blood samples, whatever the case may be, they will fly it to the location. The bomb bay opens and drops it out with a parachute and the, uh, the people on the ground recover it. Uh, they've made tens of thousands of flights very, very successfully. This is a notion for a flying defibrillator machine, and that's been used in actual use. Uh, precision agriculture, you know, can you use drones to fly over your field and find out where there are bugs, where there's not enough water, and those kind of factors. Use these systems, they're used overseas extensively to do the kind of spraying that we do with uh, manned aircraft. You could do it with unmanned aircraft. This is uh, Google Air's design uh, for a notion that says, we're gonna fly this thing over. We're gonna drop it in your backyard with whatever you ordered. There have been burritos delivered by drone. There have been all kinds of things delivered by drone. We'll see what happens. And this is kind of a, a design that Amazon has actually patented for a, a warehouse in the sky that says, hey, if you're at a ball game and you want a t-shirt, you tell us and we'll bring it down by drone. So uh, does it happen? remains to be seen. So, if you want to learn more, my book, I recommend, One Nation Under Drones. That's me on top of the, uh, the hotel in Singapore. Those are my pasty white feet, and I apologize for showing that picture. So, are there any questions? Anyone in the auditorium? Gary, do you have anything? Uh, um, um, thank you, Zoom. Professor Jackson. Uh, we had a couple of questions uh, come in over chat. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, for these you know, smaller type drones, how difficult is it to learn how to operate them? Very, very easy. Uh, you know, particularly, they are now getting smarter and smarter. Uh, and they've got features that if you lose your, your common com link, they come home. Uh, there are systems that can be embedded in them to keep them away from areas like uh, uh, airports, because that's one of the big issues is, you know, sucking up one of these things in the uh, engine of a commercial aircraft and whatnot. So you can build them with geofencing, which will not allow them to fly into the area where uh, you don't want them to fly. So, yeah, they are uh, so good. Uh, DGI, which is a Chinese company, has about a 70% share of the, uh, of the small drone hobbyist uh, market and whatnot. Uh, but there are some U.S. manufacturers that are doing them too. But, uh, you know, you can buy them for anything from, you know, $25 up to uh, thousands of dollars. And then uh, just one one final question um, over chat. Uh, these smaller type drones have infrared and night vision capabilities? Really, it's a function of how much money do you want to spend and what do you want it to do. But uh, the military versions like the, uh, the switchblade and whatnot, you know, it'll have the capability if you, in a daytime scenario, you can actually see your target, it'll give you that picture. If it's night, it'll give you an infrared picture and it also do a thermal attack mode. So uh, even though, you know, the one is 51 inches, that's a pretty good size uh, vehicle. So you can uh, put a lot in there and you get uh, the extended, uh, you know, up to 45 minutes of uh, flight time and whatnot, and you get multiple sensor capability. But the thing about the uh, uh, drones is that you have a wave off capability. 
You get an artillery round, you launch it, that's it. It's going to go wherever it's going to go ballistically and whatnot. If you're using a drone, you've got the ability to watch where it's going. And if at the last minute, uh, you know, a child, a bus, whatever happens to go in there, you've got the ability to wave off. You can de-arm the warhead and bring it back around and recover it in a net and use it again. So the earlier switchblades were designed that when you launched it, it was going to detonate. So uh, if you didn't have a target, then you just drive it into uh, drive it into the ground. But uh, they, uh, they they give uh, individual soldiers a pretty remarkable capability. And then one final question just came in. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, the legal uh, measures to control um, drones and how that's evolving, as well as um, our police using drones? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, issues about the legality and ethics of using these systems. Uh, uh, you know, the U.S. has a pretty extensive process that they go through to, uh, to find a target, make sure it's a legitimate target, uh, survey the area. If they decide it is, in fact, a target they're going to strike, they strike that target, minimize collateral damage and whatnot. Uh, some of the other folks who use these, uh, Hezbollah and uh, non-state actors and whatnot, aren't quite as uh, concerned about the uh, legal niceties and even the, uh, the moral niceties. But uh, U.S., I think, takes an extreme uh, approach to make sure we minimize any kind of collateral damage. Uh, you know, fog of war, it happens. Very difficult uh, airborne platform to detect. Is that a shovel in his hands or is that a rifle in his hands? So if there's questions, we generally do not attack that target. But there have been instances when, uh, when we've hit the wrong targets. Uh, the, uh, there's an organization called the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. Uh, Stephen Hawking, when he was alive, was part of that program. A lot of other very high-end folks would say, we just shouldn't use these things at all. And they, they lead you down a slippery slope. And one of the issues is, you know, do, does having this capability lower the bar to going to war? And I always make the case that, you know, if uh, Tim Schultz makes me mad and I want to go over there and punch him in the nose, there's a pretty good chance he's going to punch me back. So I'm going to think about that. But if I could push a button and his nose gets punched, am I more likely to do it? You bet. So the same thing in a military context, you know, if you know that you can strike that target without risking any U.S. personnel lives and whatnot, are you more inclined to do it? Now, that also applies to uh, uh, cruise missiles and other devices and whatnot that give you that standoff capability. And it's kind of the argument been going on for centuries, you know, when the uh, longbow was in invented, the idea, you know, is it, is it safe? Is it right for that uh, bowman to be standing off and shooting that thing in a far, far distance? So it's, uh, it's a discussion that will go on uh, indefinitely. As these systems get more and more sophisticated, I think they'll become more and more accurate. And uh, we hope that uh, leadership is uh, going to make the decision that we only employ lethal force when necessary, and we do it at the minimum level necessary. One, one final question came in, uh, talking about um, naval doctrine, and I think that uh, this is a, a good uh, bridge to what you were just referring to and, and people's concern about how do we um, look at doctrine and potentially like even here at, at another part of the War College in wargaming, we, we test out the use of these unmanned systems uh, to confirm that we're able to, you know, meet all legal requirements. Can you talk a little bit about that? About that? Yeah, war, the war gamers are very, very interested in, uh, in, in saying, okay, let, let me do what we would normally do, but let me add a new uh, operation to it. Uh, there was an international maritime exercise just completed a few weeks ago. Uh, 60 nations involved, uh, over 80 different uh, unmanned systems. And this was actual hardware. So, you know, they had Fire Scout out there. They had sail drones out there. They had other uh, vehicles flying and whatnot. And an opportunity to say, you know, let me think outside the box is the old saying and whatnot. 
and how are these things going to be used and make sure the operators have a notion of what they're all about. And that's one of the things I enjoy most about the course we teach here at the Naval War College. Because I say, you know, when you come into the military as a junior officer, there's a certain level of technology, you know how it works. As you get more senior and you stay around longer, the technology matures and you're comfortable with that. Well, these unmanned systems have kind of dropped in from the top. And now you have uh, commanders, captains, flag officers being asked to make decisions about systems that maybe they don't know that much about. So we're very hopeful that the students who take the course here have an opportunity to look at all these issues. One week is legal and ethical issues where we get uh, 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 Air Force RPA, remotely piloted aircraft pilot who has a PhD in ethics from Oxford, came live in the classroom and talked to the students about Let's think about these things. One of the books we use is called Killing Without Heart. And the question there is, if you're not willing to die for something, are you willing to kill for something? And that's a very interesting discussion. And, you know, it, 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 they talk about, do you have the, uh, the martial uh, attitudes and whatnot? And I think it gets carried away when you talk about drones because those arguments can still be made in a lot of other systems and whatnot. But the key is to look at what the capabilities are today, look over the horizon as to what the capabilities are gonna be. Don't make decisions based on the capability of today's systems because they are only gonna get better. And P.W. Singer, who wrote the book Wired for War says, you know, in 20 years, the systems we have will be a million times more efficient, more effective than they are today. And okay, what if we're wrong? Maybe it's only 100,000 times better, but still imagine what those capabilities can be. So understand what's going on today. We had a display here on Monday and we had uh, some high school students here looking at these systems and that's really what we like to see. I'm glad to see youth here tonight to say, you know, this is where the future is going and you need to understand the limitations and the capabilities of these systems and whatnot and make sure that as you're thinking how you're going to fight the next war you've got some other errors arrows in your quiver if you will anything else yes sir yes sir good afternoon uh thank you i know a lot of your purview focuses on the offensive use of these uh unmanned systems uh, are you able to speak to or talk to uh, defense uh, against these systems in the case of advers adversary use? Yeah, that's uh, that's the thing is, uh, you know, we're doing what we're doing. The bad guys are doing what, what they want to do. So the counter UAS kind of stuff that you saw is, you know, really small scale uh, counters to this stuff. Uh, there's a lot of work with lasers. Uh, it looks like a, a good way to intercept the larger size uh, uh, drones, the Reaper and, and larger size drones. So there, there is you know, a lot of time and effort being spent to look at what's going on. The Chinese have a lot of very robust systems. Russians, not as much, but the Chinese are very, very uh, strong and they're selling these to anybody who wants to buy them. U.S. has a pretty strict uh, export rules on, on these systems and so it's hard to hard to buy them and they're expensive. You know, you're talking about 15 to $20 million for a Reaper system. Uh, you know, the Turks will sell the one that they're using for, you know, 8 million, 10 million, whatever the case may be and whatnot. So uh, there is a concern about drone proliferation just like there is about uh, nuclear weapons, but uh, jamming is one of the uh, most significant ways we may be able to, uh, to fight these systems and whatnot. But, uh, it's a constant battle between offense and defense, and we're playing them, playing on both sides. Is there anything else, Gary? Or are we good to go? I think that we're good to go. Thank you, Professor Jackson, for that excellent lecture. Uh, with that, we'll close for this week, and everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much.